Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, Bible Talk. I'm Jeff Asher, and I am going to be leading our discussion tonight. And we encourage you to sign in and to share uh, this link or feed with uh, your own timeline and with any other page or group that will allow you to post a, such a video as this. We don't want you posting somewhere where you're violating the rules, but certainly uh, there are several groups that uh, will allow these videos, and so we hope that tonight uh, you'll take the time to uh, post those for us um, and, and see if we can't share the broadcast with as many of our friends as possible. That's what I'm doing right now is sharing with groups uh, that will allow, and I want you to do the same, uh, and uh, we should be able to have uh, a good group tonight studying with us. Just a couple of more. Uh, there we go. I think that's just about everybody. Uh, there's one more right there, and then uh, get down here. I think I've got one more I want to post to. Uh, but we ask you to share this link with your friends uh, as we get ready to study tonight. We have announced and, and have been um, sharing the links on our uh, page and in our group with a video um, that, um, uh, that tonight uh, you'll take the time. Uh, all right, we've been sharing... Uh, a, vi a link to a video uh, uh, by Rick Atchley. And Rick Atchley is uh, he's a gospel preacher, uh, preaches over uh, at the Richland Hills Church. Last I checked, and I didn't bother to verify it again today, they're in... Um, Oh, San Antonio, I think it is. I can't even remember now. But that's not important. He, he's got the link out there. Uh, it was, I think it was shared through the Abilene Christian University or something like that. But it's on YouTube. I've got the links on um, my page. And uh, you're you're welcome to view that if you haven't already viewed it. Um, we, we want you to do that at some time. But I'm going to take it just a couple of minutes to summarize what uh, Brother Ashley does in the video. It's called uh, The Chairs of the Restoration Movement. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the Restoration Movement so much tonight. I'm not going to deny that there is a historical connection between uh, Churches of Christ in the United States today and even in some uh, places around the world with what historians, religious historians, refer to as the Restoration Movement. That's that's beside the point. I will say this, that I was a Christian and I was uh, seeking to follow the New Testament long before I ever heard of the Restoration Movement or Alexander Campbell or Barton W. Stone or uh, any of these uh, great preachers that have been associated in times past uh, with the 19th century uh, religious movement in the United States called the Restoration Movement. When I became a Christian, I was obeying the gospel. I was trying to become a child of God. I wanted my sins forgiven. I believe what the New Testament said about Jesus, that he is the Son of God, and that's the confession that I made when I was baptized into Christ. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I made no confessions or pledges or promises relative to Alexander Campbell or anybody else other than Jesus Christ, and I accepted no creed other than the, the Word of God, which uh, as it is revealed in the New Testament. So, so none of those things mattered to me. I was completely and totally ignorant of them, and I think many people are. But at some point, you are exposed to that. Usually it comes about the time somebody calls you a Campbellite when you're trying to teach them what the New Testament says about water baptism or that there's only one church or uh, that 
the Lord's Supper ought to be taken on the first day of the week, that denominationalism is inherently sinful, and people then say, well, you, you're just a Campbellite. And so then you sit down with your parents or you sit down with uh, the local preacher and you, you ask, well, what's this, this thing about Campbellite? And uh, there are many people today who, who have been Christians for many years and probably have never been called a Campbellite or even heard of Alexander Campbell. And so all of that's really immaterial to what we're talking about. But there is a reality that we cannot deny that there is a historical connection. But we weren't trying to be a movement. I'm not a part of a movement. We weren't seeking to follow Campbell. We were seeking to follow Christ. And I believe part of that's what's wrong with, with Brother Ashley's whole presentation that he has capitulated to the idea that the Church of Christ is just another denomination. And I believe that's the direction he wants to go. And there are a lot of our brethren that are, that are heading that way, even today, just simply because uh, they uh, are feeling a desire to be bigger, they feel a desire to be a part of something that's, that's uh, worldwide and, and, and so there's a lot of pressure to, to join in with the denominations and to have fellowship with the denominations and so as actually is looking at that he looks at what he calls the restoration movement and these historical links and he says well we're, we're divided uh, we're never going to be able to lead the world to Christ as long as we're divided. And there's some merit in that argument, that we shouldn't be divided. But then he goes on and he, he seeks to explain why we're divided. And this is where the, the chairs of the restoration movement come in. And so he's on that uh, stage, that pulpit. He's got all these chairs stacked up there. And he starts lining them up on the the pulpit sitting in each one and carrying on a dialogue with himself as he moves down the line and he starts off by mentioning uh, J.W. McGarvey and Moses Lard and said both of those men were opposed to instrumental music and, and that's true there were several in the 19th century coming into the 20th century uh, that were advocating the use of the instrument and the missionary society and uh, those two questions were kind of joined together. But there were brethren like Brother Lard and Brother McGarvey who opposed the instrument but who did not necessarily oppose uh, the missionary society. Now, actually identified that as an inconsistency. But he identified it as an inconsistency based upon the, 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 the approach that they took to the scriptures. And he, he was trying to be humorous about it, and I, I actually kind of thought it was almost on the verge of being ridicule, because Brother McGarvey and Brother Lard both are, were great men, influential men, intelligent men, and contributed a great deal to understanding of the scriptures. But they're men, nevertheless, and they're infallible. And this is what happens. And so the problem was not with the scripture, I maintain, nor was the problem with their hermeneutic, but it was their failure to be consistent with their her hermeneutic. And this is where he kind of made the joke, said that Brother McGarvey and Brother Lard opposed instrumental music because the scriptures were silent. And when the scriptures were silent, that means were prohibited. But then later when they were asked, well, where's their authority for the missionary society? And this generally was coming from their brethren who themselves we're opposing the instrument and had come to the conclusion if we oppose the instrument we're going to have to oppose the society as well because there's just as much or just as little authority for the instrument as or for the society as there is for the instrument and so they're asking brother McGarvey and they're asking brother Lord, well how is it that you can approve of these things and and actually said well because the scriptures are silent and therefore whatever the scriptures don't forbid we we're allowed to do now, I'd like a quotation from Brother Lard or Brother McGarvey wherein that is the argument they make. He made no proffer of that in his video. But we're just going to assume that he's, he's accurately representing them. I'm not sure that he is. 
But I do know that they were inconsistent on this point. Now, how is it that they, these two great, good, intelligent, well-studied men could, could come to these conclusions and uh, be so inconsistent, it would seem? And, um, and so that's what we're going to try and look at tonight. Um, we, we want to do this uh, by, first of all, uh, establishing a fact that that the problem here is not with the scripture. I believe that anybody who makes an argument like this is essentially uh, criticizing the scriptures. Uh, he is essentially uh, questioning whether or not uh, the the uh, the script that God is capable of um, actually. Uh, communicating with us uh, see this 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 is the assumption I believe that everyone has to work from if they're going to be diligent in their Bible study and be consistent in their application is first of all that God because he is God and he is our creator is quite capable of communicating with us as his creation and that God has chosen the word method of communication and therefore if God has chosen the word method of communication, it must be adequate and it must be uh, sufficient. And that is what I believe. I believe that the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the final and sufficient revelation of God for mankind. And that we can, through it and the principles that are that are. Uh, brought over into it from the Old Testament because those things were written for our learning and we have to discern the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the law of Moses and the law of Christ. So there are a lot of things that we have to, to, to discern and the scriptures reveal how, and lead us in that. And this is where I believe that Brother Ashley's jumped off the track is simply the fact that he is not allowing the scriptures to provide him with uh, a, an adequate guide or hermeneutic for interpreting the Bible. The Bible is like no other book. It not only reveals to us the mind of God, but it reveals to us how we are to go about discerning the mind of God. But uh, the the idea here is is that that actually is criticizing uh, this principle, which I believe is a biblical principle, of the silence of the scriptures. And we're going to establish that here in a moment. But one of the things that actually said in the course of his little presentation in that video is that the way we read the Bible can only prove, produce division. Well, that may be true of the way he reads the Bible. But if we read the Bible like the Bible teaches us it ought to be read, then we will achieve unity. That's Paul's argument in Ephesians. We sometimes read the book of Ephesians and we come to the conclusion, well, Paul's talking about the church. And I don't deny that the church is a prominent theme in the book of Ephesians. But Paul does not give us a, a program or a plan for either the universal church or the local church. He states some very important facts about it. But he does not give us a, a diagram of the organization of, of the local church in the book of Ephesians. There's little to nothing in that book about the local church and its organization. Uh, there's no mention of elders or their qualifications. Of those things are confined uh, or can be found in First and Second Timothy and Titus and some other passages of the New Testament. But the book of Ephesians is not designed to reveal a pattern for the local church or even the universal church. We are told that Christ is the head of the church in the book of Ephesians, and thus the universal church is what is being uh, spoken about. But th there's no great detail of that universal church. Uh, the, we have to study a great deal of, of the New Testament to come to a proper and adequate understanding of that. Uh, and there are some things that are uh, 
that we have to think about quite a bit <laughs> to actually comprehend what is being said. But what Paul is saying in the book of Ephesians is, is that God had a plan and purpose for a people of his own possession, and that plan and purpose was realized in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that, that it is the gospel the belief of the gospel that brings the church into existence, that brings us into Christ, and those who are in Christ are his church. That's what Ephesians is about. And in chapter 3, Paul is, is very clear, after having stated God's purpose in chapter 1 and have, having uh, defined or revealed the foundation of grace, through the death of Jesus Christ, our belief in his death as the means of our salvation, that he comes in chapter 3 and he speaks about his role as an apostle in revealing the gospel. And one of the outstanding things he says in chapter 3 is, is when you read what I have written, you may have my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so there's a clear affirmation that we can understand that revelation. Uh, verse 17 says that Christ, of chapter 3, that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. We're in Christ through faith. And notice there in verse 12, he says that in whom we have boldness, that is in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him, by the faith of Christ. Not the personal faith of Jesus, but rather the faith that Paul has revealed, that the thing that's to believe. That's how we have access uh, to Christ is and confidence in Christ is through the faith, the gospel, and we and so Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, our having believed the faith, you see, and so through that, then we are able to comprehend verse 18 with all the saints. So it's not just me or just you, but all the saints have the ability by the faith of Christ to comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ. Now, that's a great thing, and we need to be confident in that truth that we can understand the gospel, and, and then that understanding of the gospel will reveal all things necessary to salvation. And in chapter 4, Paul goes on to talk about the role of apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers that had been uh, given to the church through Jesus Christ and the giving of the Holy Spirit, that these individuals had been given to teach so that we might grow up in all things in Christ. Verse 15, verse 16, we've become the perfect man in Christ. So this is the goal of the gospel is to bring us to perfection in Christ. And we learn how to live and we learn how to act and we learn what we are to do to please God and we learn what we're not to do. And so he, ta he talks at great length about how we have learned Christ and that uh, if, if we've heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And so our having heard and been taught the truth is what brings us to this uh, perfection and we can claim to have learned Christ. Now, he goes on in chapter 15 and admonishes us in this walk or how we are to behave. And, and if we're walking according to the faith of Christ, then we're bearing the fruit of the Spirit and we know what the will of the Lord is and we are wise in Christ and we are filled with the Spirit. Now, uh, th that doesn't sound like to me that there's a problem with the gospel or that there is this um, inability within man to understand the gospel or to properly apply the gospel. Now that's not to say everyone does. That wasn't even true in the first century and that's something that, that Brother Ashley never paid any attention to was the fact that division is a reality of the gospel. Jesus said, I came to bring division, not peace. I came to bring a sword you see. 
And so the gospel is divisive. Jesus is divisive. And, and so God's people are going to be segregated from the world and only those who are willing to, to sincerely and genuinely study and come to the knowledge of the truth are going to become New Testament Christians. And so division is a reality. Now there at the end of the book, chapter 6, Paul admonishes believers to put on the whole gospel of uh, the whole armor of God. And all of that armor, every piece of that armor, has a relationship to the Word of God. Even unto the, the offensive weapon which we use, which is the sword of the Spirit, which he specifically calls or says is the Word of God. But notice there, we have uh, a, our, our, Loins girt about with truth, verse 14. The breastplate of righteousness, it's the word of righteousness. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Well, we have faith through the faith. And then take the helmet of salvation, which we are saved by grace through faith. And that was back in chapter 2. So you see each one of these elements of the, of the Christian armor is directly tied to our belief of the gospel. And when we have adequately armored ourselves, then we are, we are ready to fight the spiritual battle, which is described there in verse 12 and verse 13. I don't want to take any more time on that other than to say that I believe that every one of us as children of God ought to be confident in the Word of God. We ought to be confident in our God-given ability to understand what God says. We ought to be trusting in God's ability, His willingness, His design, His intent, His eternal purpose to speak to us through the gospel. And if that's God's will and purpose, then surely you and I, if God really loved the world and God sent Jesus his son into the world to save us from sin, and that knowledge of salvation is in the gospel, then surely, surely, uh, we can understand the gospel. Now, let's notice something else here and this this gets down to where I really want to head as far as hermeneutics is concerned or really the question of how to study the Bible hermeneutics that's a 25 cent word and we just we're just talking about how to study the Bible and and, and actually said well the way we study the Bible is just destined to produce division well no it's not well then he ask another question he says in order for us to have unity is the only way possible uh, through surrendering to the conclusions of the most narrow-minded among us, and that was that was his point of that uh, uh, those chairs. He started out with instrumental music, and that's really where I think he's going. Why well, put that on there if he didn't think instrumental music was just like all these other things? If we've divided over nothing, and whether or not we have a church building is something that we shouldn't be talking about, then the instrumental music is in the same camp. Category. I want everybody to realize that. That's where he's going. He's trying to justify instrumental music, and he's already done it. They have it there where he preaches. And so this is this is the conclusion. He talked about instrumental music, and he talked about the praise teams, and really, well, what does he even mean by a praise team? He said, well, we've got eight song leaders instead of, of one. Well, no, that's not it at all. They've got Maybe they've got eight song leaders, and four of them are women. And maybe they're not always just leading the congregation in congregational singing. There are a lot of questions we could ask about that, so we want him to define that. But he tries to make that equivalent to these other things. And then he talks about uh, the uh, question of the missionary society or the sponsoring church arrangement or the orphan homes. And he gets all that in there. And true, there have been divisions over that. And then he gets further down and he Bible classes and the multiple containers for for on the um, Lord's table for the serving of the fruit of the vine. And there again, he betrays how little he knows about those issues or he's purposely uh, miscategorizing the, 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 
the controversy that surrounds multiple containers or one loaf uh, opposition to Bible classes and and things like that. And then he gets it all the way down to church buildings. And he tries to say, well, the argument against church building is that the church existed for hundreds of years that without a church building. And he says, well, the church existed for hundreds of years without an instrument. See? You see where he's going with that? That's what he's trying to prove. So if you if you think, well, this is nonsense whether or not we ought to have a church building, well, then you must, his conclusion is, well, this is nonsense whether or not we can have a piano. See? And then he tries to characterize all those who have taken different positions on this. He says, there aren't any liberals in the Church of Christ, by which he means a classic liberal or a modernist. And, and certainly, J.W. McGarvey was not a modernist because J.W. McGarvey did more in the 19th century to oppose uh, uh, modernism and German rational thought uh, coming into uh, the religious mainstream in the United States than as much as any man did and uh, opposed those things and and defended the, the integrity of the scriptures and and the deity of Jesus Christ uh, in the college, in, in his teaching in colleges. So we know that that's we're not talking about these brethren being a modernist, but is it not a liberal view, an open view, if you will, uh, to suggest that we can fellowship everybody or at least fellowship everyone on these issues and, and not have to determine what the truth is? Is, is that where, I think that's where he's going. But to answer his question, do we have to surrender to the most narrow-minded among us? No. And that's established in Galatians chapter 2, where Paul talks about the Judaizers and says, we gave place unto them not for an hour. And I can't think of anything that's more narrow-minded than their view, at least legalistic than their view, lawmaking than their view, which is... Uh, Acts 15, 1 and 2, you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. Now what <clears throat> Brother Ashley is actually talking about, and we ought to be discussing, is the idea of making a law where God hasn't made one. When I um, had my very first debate, I was just 30 years old, a long time ago, and I had never done any debating. I had done a little public, I had done some forensic work when I was in high school, uh, but never any real serious debating. And so here, here now I'm in a situation where I've got to defend a practice that I believe is right. And this is, this is the thing that I did. But I understand what Brother Ashley's complaining about, and I understand the questions that he has about it. Because one of the things I did as a young preacher was I sat down and I studied every one of these questions that's affected the church. And I came to my own conclusions about these things. And, 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 and sometimes along the way, other things that perhaps I hadn't studied yet were challenged and I had to, I had to decide where I was going to come down on that. Well, this particular, this first public debate that I had was, uh, on the subject of, of, cups and classes as it's generally characterized because our brethren who oppose multiple containers generally oppose the Bible class arrangement and in particular they oppose women teachers in the Bible classes and so actually you got three you got three propositions there and a, and a, and a fourth one uh, kind of hidden because what they believe about the cup there being one cup they also believe there can be only one unbroken loaf of bread but with respect to their argument on the container, which they want to call the cup, and that's not what Jesus is talking about in those passages. He's not talking about the container. He's talking about the contents of the container. But nevertheless, they say the container represents the New Testament. And so now we got three elements in the Lord's Supper. And that was, you see, Brother Ashley doesn't reveal any of that. There's, there's a doctrinal question there whether or not Jesus in the memorial said remember his body and his blood and the New Testament 
and then assign three uh, elements to symbolize those things. That is, the bread, the fruit of the vine, and the single container. And, and so, like I said, there's a lot of things involved in this question of, of the containers on the New Testament that Brother Ashley either doesn't understand or he didn't bother to reveal because he wanted to trivialize the division in order to promote his idea that, well, this is all ridiculous. Well, these things are not ridiculous. If, if a person has a serious question about the scripturalness of the thing, I don't care what it is. He needs to resolve that in his mind because the Bible tells us that it's a very serious matter to violate your conscience or to act without conviction. So anyway, it was my responsibility to, to, to defend this practice. And I called my friend, Brother Elmer Moore, and, and and I said, Elmer, I, I've I've got to have some help, and I know that you can do it. And he said, Oh, I'll be glad to help you, Jeff. And he he and I worked together in public debates for over twenty years. After that, have had a lot of debates where he always was my moderator and my study partner. But <clears throat> nevertheless, one of the things he said to me was that uh, it's never right to make a law where God hasn't made one. And that's what we're talking about. Are we making laws where God hasn't made any? And then the second thing is, he would say, and this is just kind of the corollary, it's never safe, okay? It's never safe to bind a liberty. Sometimes the, the, the one container brethren will say, well, this is the safe way. If we would all do it just like this, if you'll give up, and this is one of the things that, Brother actually was talking about if you'll give up your practice then we can all have fellowship and that's that's the safe way but it's never safe to bind a liberty it's never safe to make a law where God hasn't you see so there's two sides of this thing we're loosing where God hasn't loosed and we're binding where God hasn't bound and now I'm finally to the place where I can get down to the fallacy that that brother actually didn't deal with and perhaps where he uh, and I won't say he did it intentionally because he he may have not understood what he was revealing but let's go back to that Lard and uh, McGarvey illustration he said well so as they said the scriptures are silent over here when they were opposing the instrument but when they were got, got ready to authorize the the uh, missionary society the scriptures are silent and and so this is this was one of the things that brother Moore pointed out to me uh, he, he said he says Jeff because I had dealt with the orphan home question and studied those things out he says says these brethren who oppose or who who maintain that we've got to have, one container they sound just like our brethren who are trying to authorize things that are not authorized they both say the same thing so the advocate of the instrument of music says well it's not specified and so therefore we can do it but the opponent of the the uh, instrument says well it's not specified so therefore we can't do it they both say the same thing. Do you see that it's not specified or it's not, there's no example or the church didn't have this in the first century. And they just, all these little things that he went through there in that illustration of extended illustration of all those chairs. And the, the, the point was that, that I'm making is they both say the same thing and they're both wrong. Now think about it. They both say the same thing, and they're both wrong. Now, why are they both wrong? Well, they're both wrong because they are assuming, one is assuming a thing must be specified in order to be authorized, and the other one is assuming that if a thing is not specified, it is authorized. And both are wrong. 
that's not how the Bible approaches this subject at all. And so I want to take the time now uh, that I that I have left uh, that to deal with this idea that a thing doesn't have to be specified in order to be authorized, but it must be authorized in order to be expedient. Some of our brethren talk about four ways to establish Bible authority. Let me get my fingers up there where we can count them all. And they'll talk about command, and then they'll talk about examples, and then they'll talk about necessary inference, and then some of them will say expediency. And when I debated Mac Deaver on the questions of the orphan home, uh, this was his argument right here. He said, well, it's expedient, therefore it's authorized. No. Let's prove that it's authorized. Command, example, necessary inference. Let's get something authorized. And then we'll talk about what's expedient to carrying out the thing that is authorized. And expedient simply is advantageous or prosperous to the execution of some activity. But when we're talking about and, and then and, and expedience, sometimes some people, our brethren will talk about aids and additions. And there's a difference between an aid and addition. Um, and that's hard for people to grasp. And I have struggled with years of trying to make this as simple as possible. And so let's not worry about whether, and let's not talk about expediency except for me to simply make the point that because something is advantageous to executing an activity doesn't make it expedient or mean it's authorized. See, I even have trouble with it. Doesn't mean it's authorized. And so we've got to establish an act, area of activity and then once we've established that area of activity then we come down to what has God said. And this is where I think my illustrations are going to be helpful. And so I've got five principles here that I want to share with you tonight. I'll post these on the Facebook group page later in the file section. So those of you who want to download it can. And this is point number four under B of the outline that I'll post. But there are basically five principles I want us to get tonight. And the first of these is this, that when a kind is specified, then every other kind is excluded. And I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. And every one of these that I talk about tonight, I'm going to illustrate with scripture. But in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. For he of whom these things are spoken, he's talking about Christ, who was going to be made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that's a quotation from the 110th Psalm. So the question arises, well, how is it that Christ is a priest? Well, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But wait a minute, the Hebrew writer says. The Old Testament, the Law of Moses, talked about a Levitical priesthood. And the Hebrew writer's argument is, is that perfection, that is completion, achieving salvation according to God's purpose, was not going to be achieved through the Levitical priesthood. That's verse 11. For under it the people received the law. So the Levitical priesthood was something associated with the law of Moses. What further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? In other words, if the law is sufficient, and that's the real issue he's dealing with, if salvation is through the law of Moses, why did David write in the 110th Psalm, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek when he was talking to the Messiah? His conclusion will be that the law has to be changed. We'll see that here in just a moment. So he goes on in verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is, a made, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. 
For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Now, what the Hebrew writer is saying is not that Moses didn't say anything at all about priesthood. Moses said a lot about priesthood. And what Moses said about the priesthood was, at least this one point, that the tribe of Levi was specified. All right? So my, my principle here is when a kind is specified, any other kind is excluded. So the kind specified is the tribe of Levi. What kind of tribe of Levi? So God specified that tribe under the law for priesthood. That necessarily then excluded every other kind of tribe of Israel. Levi was one tribe of Israel. There were 11 other tribes of Israel. And the one tribe that was chosen was Levi and every other tribe was excluded. Now God settled that matter in number 16 when Dathan and Korah and Abiram and, and those others who were of different tribes wanted to have the same prerogatives as Aaron and his sons with regard to entering the tabernacle and offering incense on the altar. And Moses said, no, God has chosen Aaron. And he said, here's, here's how we'll prove this. Everybody bring their staff, one staff for every tribe, and we're going to lay those things here in the tabernacle, and then we'll see what God thinks about this. And so they did. They laid those 12 rods there. And you remember that when they brought the rods out, Aaron's rod budded almonds. And I don't even know if the rod was made out of almond wood. I rather doubt it. But the rod itself budded almonds. It had almond leaves. It had almond flowers. It had almond fruit. And so Aaron's rod budded. The, and that's how it's referred to. And then later it was put into the, into the Ark of the Covenant, you remember. Aaron's rod that budded in the golden pot of manna, as well as the two testaments of stone. Those things were laid up in the Ark of the Covenant. Well, so here's the point. It's not that Moses didn't say anything at all because Moses said a lot of things. But what Moses said was is that the tribe of Levi only. Therefore, if we're going to have a priest under the law, He's got to be a Le Levitical priest. So God excluded, of which tribe Moses spake nothing. Now his conclusion is then, well, then the law must be changed in order for there to be another, tri another tribe, another kind of priest. And that's his point, that the law of Moses was done away so that the law of Christ, the New Testament, Old Testament was done away so that the New Testament could take effect. Therefore, we no longer have a Levitical priesthood. That's all been fulfilled. And now we have the Melchizedek priesthood. I wish our friends who are Mormons were listening tonight and would get that lesson. But that's the principle. When God specifies a kind, that excludes any other kind. Now, the second principle is very much like that. And this is what so many of our brethren need to learn. When, when, when a method or a means is specified, any other method or means is excluded. And we'll use another Old Testament example here. You'll remember in Numbers chapter 7, when the, the tabernacle was being set up and dedicated, that each of the 12 tribes brought gifts. The 12 princes of the 12 tribes brought gifts. And what among the gifts that they brought were these covered wagons, not a conestoga, but an ox cart that had a cover over it. They brought these covered wagons. And there were 12 of them, and they were divided up among Aaron's sons. But to the sons of Kohath, none of the wagons were given. 
They were given, the 12 wagons were given to the other sons so that they could load up the furniture of the, uh, the not the furniture, but the, the, all the boards and the curtains and all of that stuff that was not specified to be used with regard to the Ark of the Covenant, all right? Those things that were a part of that, that was their service, the service of these other sons, could be loaded on these carts and these wagons were used. But, he said, I'm not giving any, and this is in chapter 7 of the book of Numbers. There, go and read it. Verses 1 through 9. I'm not giving any to the sons of Koath because their duty is to bear it on their shoulders. So, first thing I observe here is there's nothing inherently evil about an ox cart. They use them. But God had specified the method that the tabern the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Tabernacle was to be conveyed. And it was to be conveyed through those poles that were carried on the shoulders of the sons of Kohath. That was same for the Ark, uh, not only the Ark of the Covenant, but the altar of incense, the table of showbread. And these things were all wrapped up in the, in the blue uh, curtains of the tabernacle and and they were carried so no one ever saw what was under these things the poles were just sticking out and the sons of Kohath carried them and you'll remember when they crossed the Jordan they stepped into the Jordan carrying that and the waters went back and the children of Israel um, crossed over and again in chapter 4 of the book of Numbers those first 15 verses all of this is detailed with regard to who who's responsible for what and again the sons of Kohath are said to, to carry it. And chapter 7 is based on that instruction that was previously given in chapter 4. Now you'll remember that many years later in 1 Chronicles 13, which is paralleled in 2 uh, Kings, that David wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant from uh, where it was up to... to it'd been, the, the Ark had been captured and the Philistines had it and it had come back to, and they had released it and they put it on an ox cart. So the Philistines put it on an ox cart and they sent it back and it stopped at Beth Shemesh and that's where it stayed because the men of Judah looked inside the ark. They took the coverings off and looked inside and God smote them. They died. And so the, the ark just stayed right there in Beth Shemesh your Jeff Jerem uh, in the house of a couple of Levites. David wanted to move it, and so he had a new ox cart built and sent it down there. And you remember Uzzah, and the ox cart stumbled, and the ark was going to fall, and Uzzah reached forth his hand to stay the ark, and God smote him. He made a breach on us and the place where that happened at, Nas uh, at the threshing floor. I think it's Nashon's threshing floor, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, they renamed that place Perez Uzzah, meaning breach upon Uzzah. So God broke out on Uzzah. And David was very concerned. He says, how shall the Ark of the Covenant come to me there at the end of chapter 13? Well, when you get over to chapter 15 and verse 13, David calls all the leaders of Israel up to him. He says, well, the reason why this happened was because you, and he's talking to the priest, you didn't do it after the due order. You let me tell you what to do, and I didn't know what I was talking about, and you should have stopped me. You should have known what God required. You fellas were supposed to carry that thing, so now we're going to do it the right way. Now, there's my point. God had specified a method. He let them use ox carts in association with other parts of the tabernacle. He even let the Philistines sing, send the thing home on an ox cart. But the point is, is when the children of Israel were doing what God said to do, when they were conveying that ark, they were supposed to do it a certain way, bearing it by the staves on the shoulders of the sons of Kohath. Well, there's no point in arguing about methods when God specifies a method then that's how it's supposed to be done. So this is, and this is where we have problems on this subject of church cooperation or the missionary society, the orphan home, the college, all these things is because we're talking about that, that was what I said, well, methods and God doesn't bind methods. Well, God most certainly does bind methods. 
And with respect to cooperation, he has bound methods. And if I need to discuss that sometime, I will. But that's the problem here. We're not observing these principles that are Bible principles. That's all I'm trying to prove tonight, that these are Bible principles. Now, the third one is, a thing must be consistent with a biblical principle in order to be authorized. Consistent with a biblical principle. Then let's look in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua, chapter 22. This is one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. I think simply because it's called the story of Ed, and one of my best friends was Ed. And I never think about this story that I don't think about him. And he even worked up a so sermon title of which was the story of Ed. Uh, but anyway, uh, in chapter 22, after the conquest of Israel, you'll remember that the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half Reuben, Manasseh, and the half tribe of Gad um, were on the east side. I got that backwards after I corrected myself. It's Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh straddled. But anyway, so there are these two and a half tribes that are on the east side of Jordan. And they had promised God that they would go with the children of Israel and they would help the other ten and a half tribes conquer the land. And after they had done that, they parted and God said, go home, go home to your families. And so they went home. And when they got to the Jordan River, they said, you know, we're going to build an altar. And this altar is not for the burning of sacrifices. This altar is to be a memorial. So it's basically going to he raise up a heap of stones as a memorial. And what this is going to do is teach our children and the, the children of the ten and a half tribes that we take very seriously our inheritance in the land. You remember that they asked for that good grassland over there because they all had cattle. But God said, no, your inheritance is over here. And, and they said, but this is so good and, and let us have this and we will serve God and we will do whatever he says do about the conquest. And they did. And God gave them that land and it's beautiful land, bountiful land. And they kept their word. And so they wanted to raise a memorial to their having kept their word and to their so their children would know that they had an inheritance in Israel, that the God of the tribes on the west was their God and that Jerusalem would be, not at that time because Jerusalem hadn't been established, but wherever God put his name, that was what the, the pledge was, wherever God put his name, that's where they would go to worship. And for a long time it was Shiloh and then it was in Jerusalem ultimately. It was at Gilead first, then it was at Shiloh, and then it was in Jerusalem. And they raised that monument. Well, the other ten and a half tribes said, wait a minute. What are they doing building this altar over here? Because God has specified, and that goes back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 12, verses 5 through 14. God has said that they're not going to build any altars to offer sacrifice except the altar of the tabernacle. When they got into the land, they weren't going to just offer sacrifice anywhere. They weren't just going to slay their animals anywhere. They had to bring them to the door of the tabernacle and then ultimately the door of the temple. And that's what the law was. That's what Deuteronomy bound on the children of Israel. And so now Phinehas, who was the high priest, and the princes of Israel were very concerned that Reuben, Gad, and tribe Manasseh were forsaking God and that this was going to bring the wrath of God on the whole nation. And so they called everybody up and they marched an army over there to that altar and they were ready to do war. And they sent an embassy over there and said, now look, if you fellas are not satisfied to worship at the tabernacle because you think it's inconvenient or something, then you just pick up and come over here and live with us and we'll give you a place to live. Because we're not going to have this altar to offer sacrifices. And the two and a half tribes on the east said, wait a minute. And I'm paraphrasing, you know that. So wait a minute. That's not what we're doing. 
We didn't build this altar to offer sacrifices on. We know that's wrong. And if you think that's what if that if that's what we've done, then you come on, you slay us, and God will be with you. But that's not it at all. And then they explained what they did. And here's what Phinehas said. Well, since that's the case, then we don't have any reason to oppose this. And this is a very important principle. That those who two things. One those who are engaging in a practice have the responsibility to show a thing is in harmony with the scriptures. They built an altar. The, the prohibition was against an altar to burn sacrifices on. They didn't build an altar to burn sacrifices on. They had not violated that law. They built an altar, yes. The prohibition was not against building every altar because Joshua himself set up altars after they came over in the land, plastered one of them over and, and, and wrote the commandments on it and did the same thing out in uh, the, the, the valley where they had the blessings and the cursings. So they, they hadn't violated any law here. They just min misunderstood what they were doing. And once they established that what they were doing was in harmony with a biblical principle, there wasn't any precept that was being violated, then those who were opposing the practice said, all right, then you go right ahead. Now, did Phinehas and the princes of Israel build altars all the way back home? There's absolutely no indication that they did. Now, brethren, this would help us in a lot of our controversy if we would recognize that those who have a practice have the obligation to present the authority and show that it doesn't violate any principle. And then we could get down to working together. And so whether we're talking about church cooperation, we're talking about kitchens, or we're talking about praise teams, we're talking about the instrument of music, the one whose practice it, it is needs to take up the book and establish authority. And that's why we have had so many debates in the history of the church, even among ourselves, is because we challenge each other to establish Bible authority. And it's only after folks refuse to accept Bible authority that division comes. Well, I'm just about out of time. My last two pr principles are these. An example must be unique and consistent to be exclusive. When somebody says a thing is not exemplified, well, if it e even if it is exemplified, it doesn't have to be exemplified in order to be authorized, but even if it is exemplified, it must be unique and consistent. That is, it's the every example we find is that way. That's the case with the Lord's Supper. It's always on the first day of the week. There's not an example of any other day of the week. I challenge someone to find one. Same thing with giving. When we have the saints giving, it's on the first day of the week. Those are the examples we have. And there's nothing that contradicts that. And we could go on with other things. That's the case with church cooperation. The examples are consistent. And so we don't have anything that leads us to the conclusion that there isn't a binding pattern. And then liberty only exists within the realm of what is authorized. Let's take up the church building here. That, uh, that other, let me give you Acts 20 and 7 and Titus 1 5 were passages that could have been used on that idea of examples. One was the Lord's Supper, the other was elders. But this last one, liberty only exists with, with, within the realm of what is authorized. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, all things are lawful unto me. And I had a, of all things, a homosexual preacher say, well, Paul says everything is lawful. lawful. Homosexuality is one thing. Therefore, homosexuality is lawful. Wait a minute. That is not what Paul said. Paul didn't say everything, anything and everything in the world is lawful because he goes on in that passage to state the fact that the body is for meat and meat for the body, but the body is not for fornication. Okay? So all things are lawful within the realm of what's authorized. So he's talking about meat. He can eat pork or he can eat uh, chicken. And the Gentiles was eating pork and he was eating catfish. And the Jew was saying those things were unclean. And Paul says, no, 
Meats for the belly, the belly for meats. So all things within the realm of food, because the law has been done away. You see, and Christ gave no uh, restrictions on what to eat. That's what the Jews were fussing about in the first century. Uh, but with regard to fornication, fornication was, was, was immoral. And when they wrote to the Gentiles, they said, keep yourselves from idols and from things strangled, which was associated with things offered unto idols, and so blood, and from fornication, you see. And so uh, the point is, is that we, within the realm of what's authorized, so let's look at the church building, I said. So what's authorized? First day of the week of sim assembly. Is any particular place authorized? No. So they can meet under a tree, they can meet by a river, they could meet in a, a large upper room, they could meet in the school, they could meet in the temple if there was a place there to meet. They weren't keeping the law, they were just meeting because there was enough room there. Someone could, how did they get that large upper room? Did they buy it? Did they rent it? Did someone give it to them? It's not specified. There's no indication whatsoever. So the place is not bound and we can, we have liberty, choice, as long as we're able to meet to do what the church is supposed to do. So there's that principle illustrated. Well, thank you for listening tonight. We're out of time, and we hope that you'll join us next week. And I'm not sure yet what direction we're going to go, but we may explore these things a little bit more uh, if you'll submit your questions. Thank you very much, and have a very good evening.